Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. We're three games into the first round, and the first ever episode of Playoff Fireside Chat is here. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And Matt, the Flames are up 2-1 to one after Game 3. How you feeling, buddy? Awesome. The Flames played their hearts out in front of the Sea of Red yesterday. It was amazing to be there, and what more can you ask? Well, let's get there. Let, why don't we start by talking about this team uh, game by game and taking it that way, if that works for you. Sounds like a plan. So why don't we start with Game 1. Game 1 was last week. It was on Wednesday. The Flames opened the season or opened the series in Vancouver. And this was a this was the game that you thought it was going to happen. I didn't, but uh, Sam Bennett drew into the lineup and started his first um, playoff series with the Flames, his second game he's ever played with the Calgary Flames. Um, he drew into the lineup. What did you think of Bennett's performance in game one? The thing I liked most about Bennett's game was his driving to the net and the willingness to crash into lack if need be and just generally being a pain for the Vancouver Canucks. I don't think they were expecting him to play as much or as well, and you kind of saw that with the defense pairings that they were matching up against him. Yeah, I thought that was interesting with Vancouver having the last change, seeing who they were putting out there with them. And he's playing, uh, for those that don't know, he's on what's being called the BBC line. It's Bennett, Backlund, and Colborne right now. And looking at that line, I think I think Colborne maybe is a little bit out of place, but I like the chemistry we're starting to see develop between Backlund and Bennett as well. Yeah, for sure. And the thing that uh, has impressed me most about that line is Colborne's willingness to fight for the puck in the corner. Usually he's not the most physical player out there, but he's been not only engaging with hits, but also using his large frame to protect the puck. And and that's the thing is I think a lot of these guys in the Flames roster have been given a role, it seems. Like just looking at their games, it seems like everyone's been given a job. And we're starting to see Flames, each guy doing something different very well. And I think that's part of the reason the Flames are having success. Oh, for sure. And the Flames have a game plan, which is to just hit everything in a Canucks jersey and look for mistakes caused by that. Like in game one, uh, with Furland and a couple other players, they uh, were hitting Yannick Weber, and it caused him to make some mistakes. And that eventually led to him turning the puck over and allowing Furland to get the puck to f- set up uh, David Jones for the tying goal. Yeah, well, I think hitting anything in blue is probably the kind of theme of um, at least Furland's playoff campaign so far. I, I To me, that's everything that he's been doing. Like, there's nothing that he's, nothing that he's not hitting if it's out there in, in blue. Yeah, and... and... With the Flames losing Lance Bulma in the last couple of weeks of the regular season... Furland's really stepped up. Yeah, and I was wondering who of the Flames would take that role on, because that's traditionally been Bulma's role on the team. Well, let's do some general impressions of Game 1. Um, first off, I'll ask you, were you surprised that Mason Raymond did not play Games 1 and 2? Not particularly, because he has struggled, and... You got to figure that a pissed off Mason Raymond is better than a Mason Raymond that's just going into the playoffs. And he's probably was amped up because the Canucks were his former team and wanting to exact some retribution there. So having him sit for the first two games made him a lot more determined once he returned to the lineup and i thought he had a very excellent game three so did i uh what are your impressions of game one matt as a as a whole i thought the flames did well to weather the storm a bit uh, especially in the first period you knew that vancouver because they had home ice in front of their fans that they were going to be coming out like gangbusters trying to get the lead 
and the Flames kept them at bay, and they did end up scoring the first goal in, late in the second period, but the Flames came out, and they just kept steady with their game and just did what they normally do and came back and found a way to win. In the first period, it seemed to me like Vancouver was really taking advantage of us and making the Flames skate a lot. It looked like their strategy was to tire us out. That puck was going back and forth so often that I thought the Flames were just going to be gassed by the third period. Well, and in fact, they actually were in the first five minutes or so of the third period as Vancouver really pushed to try and make it 2 nothing. But uh, thankfully, Jonas Hiller made uh, quite a few good glove saves in that to uh, keep it within one and allowed the Flames the opportunity to come back and find the win. And if you would have asked me who I thought the first Flame to score in the playoffs was, I would not have thought it would have been Dave Jones. Well, the thing is that you always, once the playoffs start, you need your depth guys to come in and perform. And guys like Brandon Bolig, David Jones, Michael Furland, Sam Bennett, those aren't guys that have been relied on all year to be the, the guys, but you know, every goal is vital in the postseason, and it doesn't really matter where it comes from as long as the pucks go in their net. Yeah, no, that's that's very true. As long as the pucks are going past Eddie Lack, that's the important thing. Um, when I look back at Game 1 and I look at my notes here, once the Flames were able to calm down and control the play a bit, they played a lot better. I thought that the third period was pretty much all Calgary. Yeah, other than the first five minutes, but once they weathered the Canucks' initial push, they were off to the races, and Vancouver had no answer whatsoever. Yeah, and I was almost worried that it was going to be too little too late when we got down to the last minute and that you know the Flames were making a push, but it would go to overtime, and I wasn't confident we'd win that. So I was quite excited when we saw Chris Russell uh, put put the puck in the net with 30 seconds left in the game. I thought, wow, that's that was, I guess, quite the emotional end of the first game, and I thought it was a fitting end. Yeah, and I like how Sam Bennett was very effective, not only in Game 1, but also in Game 3, at standing in front of the goalie and providing a perfect screen to prevent the goaltender from seeing the point shot. Because that's how... Uh, Brody scored his first goal in game three. Yeah, we got two defensemen who've scored because of that now. Mm -hmm. Well, let's move on to game two then. Unless there's anything else about the first game you want to talk about. No, I, I was just impressed that they came out and found a way to win. Yeah, you know, when I looked at it, um, the Flames had two games in Vancouver. I thought if we could come back to our barn with one of them under our belt, we'd won that, that two-game series. And doing that and winning the first game, I think really set the Flames up in a good position. Yeah, it definitely took the edge off, so that way, like even if they did end up losing game two, it wasn't the end of the world. Like we saw in the Winnipeg-Anaheim series that the Jets allowed the Ducks to come back in game two and steal a victory sending them back to Winnipeg down 0-2, and now the Jets look like they're not going to have a chance in the series where if they manage to hold on, they might have. Yeah, and that was my worst fear, was the Flames would come back to the Dome down two games. Well, going into Game 2, which again was in uh, Vancouver, um, this was a game that was much more, I, I think, much more of a battle between the two. The first game to me had playoff intensity, but it felt like a regular season game. By the time we got to play out to game two, to me it felt like a playoff game. There was uh, both sides playing really hard. We had, you know, what happened at the end, which we'll talk about. And in game two, the Canucks outshot the Flames 32-23 to and ended up winning 4-1. to Well, you knew that you knew that Vancouver was going to come out desperate. You did, and they looked like a desperate team. Yeah, because the last thing that they wanted was to come to Calgary down 0-2 and have to face the Sea of Red. <laughs> and, yeah, that just would not have been a good situation for Vancouver. No. And it you saw that in how they played in the first five minutes. They just kept throwing everything at Hiller until they got two by him. Yeah, and, and that was the thing. I think the, the two early goals 
probably helped them get that much more pumped up. For sure. And Calgary, they didn't have a good pushback at, at all uh, throughout the game. They they were trying, but it seemed like Vancouver was just getting the sticks in the right places to prevent any passes, and they couldn't get any cohesive plays going. Watching that game, too, when I was looking at the Canucks, it seemed like they'd done their homework. Like It seemed like the team retreated after game one, watched their video footage, and came back, and they seemed to know exactly how to solve the Flames. Yeah, and that's a testament to their ability to bounce back. And, you know, it was a good game for them. Uh, they did the perfect desperate game and won 4 one yeah good for them i mean it was in their barn they needed the win and they came out and got it and i think that's all we can really say is they came out and earned the win that they needed yeah it the wasn't that the flames blew it by having exceptionally bad defense or goaltending or anything the other team just wanted it more and they even the series yeah, and, and I think that's, you know, if the Flames had come out flat, I'd be disappointed. But to me, I think the Flames did everything they could in that game, and it just wasn't working. So, you know, it is what it is. You can't go 16-0 and all the way to the Stanley Cup. <laughs> there are going to be bumps in the road. There's always going to be a loss. And let's talk about the part that was best known about Game 2, and that's that that game between the two teams, we racked up 166 penalty minutes. Um, I think, to me, Game 2 felt the most like a playoff series between two rivals because we really saw them getting riled up. Um, at 18.43 into the, second, into the third period, everything just fell apart, and the Flames' uh, Bob Hartley put his, his enforcer line out, Boleg and England and Furland primarily, and everybody just paired off and started dancing. Yeah, I the one thing that... I, I liked about the 2004 Flames team was that when they lost handily like they did against Vancouver in game two, they did not go quietly in the night. They mixed it up. They fought. They hit. They did everything. And you can call that borderline dirty pool, but it sends a message to the other team that, you know, you might have won this one, but we're going to still be coming at you and, you know, we'll see you in a couple days. Yeah, and, and you're right. I mean, that was the thing is the Flames made it so even if they lost to you, you are hurting. Mm-hmm. And it definitely set the tone for the return visit to the Saddle Dome. Yeah, and, and it looked that's what Game 2 looked like to me as well is that you know, the Flames wanted to say, hey, we know we're not going to win this one. We know that, you know, there's no way at this point we can come back. So let's go out there. I don't think there was an attempt to injure. I just think the Flames wanted to show these guys that, yeah, we've we've got some grit. And, you know, this is what you're going to expect when you head into our barn next game. Yeah, I didn't think that the, anything that the Flames did was particularly dirty in that game. Just uh, quite a few hard hits and the finishing of checks, that's all. So, you know, if, if we look at what happened in that, I guess we'll call it a, I don't know if it's a fight or a scrum or whatever you want to call it at the end. Um, what? So if we look at it, we had two players who were trying to take on Derek England at the same time. To me, that was the most dangerous thing on the ice. What about you? Yeah, and I don't understand the penalties there because if you look at how that whole thing transpired, Dorset actually started both fights. Not England, and yet England got the instigating penalty. It didn't make a lot of sense to me. No, Dorset got a game misconduct for fighting against, or a game misconduct against Eric England, a fighting major against England, a second fighting major against England, and then England got a misconduct against Dorset, another misconduct against Dorset, a third misconduct against Dorset, and two fighting majors against Dorset. So, and the instigator. And I don't. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't understand how. England was seen as the instigator there. No, like, yeah, he did give Dorset quite <laughs> a rough ride during the fight, but it didn't make a lot of sense. And 
like what Dan Hamuse said with uh, the linesman instructed him to go over and like break up that fight. Well, uh, that's not Hamuse's job. That's the linesman or the refs. Well, that's it. It's the it's the officials' job to break it up. They're not outsourcing to players on the ice. No, because that's not, you know, like, they were in the process of escorting Furland and Stajan off, which I don't blame them, but, you know, you have four guys on the ice that are responsible for breaking up fights, and you saw the one referee just standing there while the two Canuck players were on England, and he's just standing there talking to them. Matt, he wasn't standing there, he was supervising. Do you even know what your job is? Like, if I was a person in charge of player safety with the Players Association, I would have had a very <laughs> vocal <laughs> disapproval of what the refs did. No, in we that haven't contest. heard from the refs if that was confirmed or denied, or from someone in the officials' organization, have we? No, it's just that to me, like that was the most reckless thing that they did was allowing the gong show to go on. Yeah, I agree. And and the fact well, I guess to me the fact that two guys were taking on were taking on England, that should have been penalized. Like, you know, one of those guys should have been kicked out cuz that's that's not something that you want to set precedent for. No, cuz then who's to say that anybody could join in as a third guy? Yeah, like, exactly. It, you know, that's not No. And I was also surprised earlier in the game, I forget who it was, I think it was Furland who was in the net, and Eddie Lack got up and punched him in the side. Oh, that was Bolig. Was it Bolig? And it was a deliberate punching motion. And it's like, come on, like, where are the officials? You can't just punch a guy. No, and like that, even if that was just a two-minute minor for roughing, you know, make a balance call with, like, say, Bolig getting two for roughing as well even it off so that way one team's not getting a penalty like a power play situation out of it but call it maybe i look at it wrong you tell me if you think this is the right way to look at it or if you have different insights i think that you have to set precedent you have to say in a especially in a playoff series where it's the same teams playing against each other for potentially seven games what you will and won't allow and if you don't penalize the goalie when he punches somebody, then it's okay for our goalie to punch somebody, and he can't penalize it the second time. If you look at the fine that Bob Hartley received, like he got a $50,000 fine, it, the incident that happened in Game 3, Willie Desjardins did not get a fine. Well, let's talk about that fine in Game 2 first. So, um, who is... Do we know what the fine is for? Do we know who's actually giving that fine out and what for? To me, all I heard was the NHL fine Bob Hartley fifty grand. Yeah, and that was for playing players that are on his roster. That's it. Which he has the right to do, and Willie Desjardins even came out and said he he said that the coach's job is to I forget exactly his quote, but essentially the coach's job is to you know try and win, and I don't fault Bob for doing what he did. No, and like even last year when the Flames had that incident with Vancouver, all the Flames did was start their fourth line, which wasn't the first time last season that that happened. It, it was a somewhat regular occurrence, and yet Tortorella took offense, and that's how that whole incident happened. You you have four lines in order to play them, and Hartley and Desjardins for most of the game were cycling through their four, th four lines. So, like, I really don't understand the NHL's reasoning other than the fact that Hartley did get fined a couple of times in the past. And not only that, Desjardins had the chance to match that line. Could have put out whoever he wanted to do to match that line, and yeah, he put out some tough guys, but he could have, you know, he could have instructed his guys to just walk away. You know, look, I see who's on the ice. It's not a surprise. Win the face-off, skate the other way. Don't let them fight you. Exactly. Don't push and shove after the whistle. Just skate back to the bench. No big deal. Or just, you know, win the face-off, knock the puck all the way back, and let's just get an icing and do it again. Yeah. So I personally don't understand why. I mean, Hartley was within his rights. There's no evidence that he was out there attempting to injure. And if anyone should have got fined, I think it was Desjardins because his guys were the ones that were playing dirty during that scrum. 
Um, so after that game, uh, Bob Hartley had a press conference, would not acknowledge the fine. Um, the GM, Brad Treliving, pretty much came out and said the team stands behind Bob Hartley, but that the team also didn't understand why the league had fined him. Um, so obviously some confusion there. We're not the only ones. Yeah, it, it, it didn't seem like... Like, if you remember back to 04 when uh, the Flames uh, got into that brawl at the end of a ga- regular season game against Nashville where Kipper fought Vokun, like, that was understandable because he sent all goons out there with, like, two seconds and basically told them to go attack the other team. So that was an understandable fine, but the the situation in game two was nothing like that. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And I mean, the fact that there were guys in the ice who weren't fighters, like I think Stajan was on the ice. Yeah, like if you were going to goon it up, the last guy that you would want out there is Corey Potter and Matt Stajan. Like, give me a break. (laughs) So yeah, I mean, that to me tells me this wasn't an attempt to just goon it up. But the league did what the league did. I, you know, I'm not happy that Hartley got fined, but it is what it is. Yeah, it, like normally, like I don't complain about the refing or things that the NHL does. The only problem that I had with the whole situation was the lack of player safety and regards for the players on the ice. That's why I was pissed. I guess the fact that they didn't say anything, like to me, it should have been. We're finding Bob Hartley. This is why. Yeah, because then you could disagree with what they did or agreed with what they did if they had an actual explanation. Like it when they hand down suspensions for that, they'll have uh, somebody from the NHL make one of those videos of reviewing that used the to be Shanahan's thing. Yeah, yeah, and saying we believe that he deserves a three-game suspension or whatever. They should be doing that for things like fines as well, so that way you can understand, okay, this is exactly why you're doing that. Exactly, and then the other coaches around the league know too. You know, Bob got got suspended for this, so I'm not going to try that. But without having that, without having that kind of um, transparency, it's like the league is just finding Calgary because they decided that you know they want to find Calgary. Which really isn't fair. No, but it is what it is, and we move on. We did move on, and we came back to Calgary for Game 3, where we found out that Derek England's uh, suspension had been revoked by the league. And this was the first game back in the Flames' barn for this playoff run. This is the first time they've had a playoff game in a long time here. And everyone in the city was electric. Um, You know, the excitement, I wasn't even at the game, but you could feel the excitement all throughout the city. Matt, you went to the game. Before we talk about it, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the Dome was like for that game? An hour before the game, that's when I arrived at the Saddle Dome. And there was only about a third of the seats filled. And it was louder in that time than it is during most regular season games. And this was before the pregame skate and everything. And uh, there was some representative from the Canucks that was uh, handing out uh, the white towels to Canuck fans. And there were a few. Really? They all kind of congregated behind uh, the Vancouver bench. And like every time they were waving the flags, everybody would boo. It was quite funny. And I'm surprised the Flames would let them hand that out. I, I don't personally mind. There There wasn't very many... Vancouver fans in the building. I think there was probably about 100, 150. Well, that was my next question because when I looked at the, you know, the arena on TV, it looked like it was solid red. So I was wondering how many blue jerseys or white Canucks jerseys even we had to f- to fill the place up. It looked like when the Flames go on the road to say like Philadelphia and you'll see like the odd guy wearing a Flames jersey, that's basically how scattered it was for vancouver fans which is weird to me because usually we get quite a few vancouver fans like every game i've gone to where the canucks have been playing against the flames usually there's a lot of canucks fans in the building yeah usually there's about 2500 or so yeah i'd say yeah i'd say maybe about you know a a 20 percent of the people there maybe maybe that's high but 10 to 20 percent are wearing vancouver jerseys 
Yeah, and that's normal. Like, you know, there's usually a large amount of support, but it was the reddest I think I've ever seen the building. Well, that's awesome. And uh, did you go to the tailgate party? Uh, no. So if anyone is going to a home game, I think they're doing it for both games. The Flames are having an official tailgate party at the Dome. Uh, there's more information as to when they start and exactly where they are at the Calgary Flames website. Did you take in the Red Mile at all, Matt? Uh, no, I headed home because I had to write the post-game article afterwards. So You're not going to get a lot of chance to do it, my friend. you got to take advantage of it while we've got it. There will be more games next round. That's true. The thing I'm curious to see, and I wasn't able to make it down to the Red Mile on Sunday. Um, I was working, but my question is going to be where the hangout is going to be this year because Melrose was kind of the the central part of the Red Mile, and it's gone now. So I don't know where the the Red Mile is going to congregate. That'll kind of sort itself out organically. Yeah, if I was a bar owner down there, I'd be doing everything I could to uh, to try and get the fans in because, as we know, that can be quite a good business and you know i mean i was at i was trying to find a bar to watch the game at on uh game two and we went to six bars and they were full and so you know this is good business for all the bar owners in calgary yeah i'm sure that all the owners of the restaurants are hoping for a very long playoff run for calgary (laughs) All right, well, why don't we uh, why don't we talk about the home game then? So the Flames came onto home ice, and um, it, it was electric. I could feel it through the TV, and they were able to come back against the Canucks. I wouldn't be surprised if the uh, find to Coach Hartley was part of their motivation. And they managed to get the 4-2 to win against their arch rivals to get up 2-1 uh, to one in the series. What were your general thoughts on that game? You could tell that the Flames were feeding off the energy of the Sea Red. And throughout the entire game, the fans were consistently loud. And I think that was probably the loudest that they have been throughout a full game. Usually, like in the second period, they quiet down a bit, even in the playoffs. But like they were right through doing various Eddie Lack chants and... Where's your daddy? <laughs> well, yeah, and it was weird because his dad was always on TV for the first two games. Like, I don't know why you would single some relative out. Like, you do it once, but you don't keep flashing back to them after, like, every save. Well, and that's what seemed to be happening, yeah. It's like everything that Locke did, they went to his dad, and his dad wasn't doing anything interesting. No, he's just standing there clapping or whatever. It's like, okay, sure. But yeah, I, I heard <laughs> that. I actually heard that chant on TV, and I thought it was pretty funny. Yeah, no, the guys in our area, I'm in Section 217, and like the guys in 218 were just going absolutely crazy. It It sounded crazy on TV. Like, you know, I imagine it was probably... Uh, electrifying to be there and probably hard for, you know, the even the Canucks to, and the Flames too, for that matter, to concentrate on what was going on. Yeah, and the Flames, every time, like, Furland or Bennett or Colborne or anybody would throw a hit, like, the crowd would just come alive. And, like, I could see a lot of uh, players taking that like as motivation that you know i want to get an ovation so here let me go and hit somebody well let's break down that home game um first period calgary started out the scoring fairly early but uh about five minutes in brandon bowling got the first home goal of this year the first home flames playoff goal in a while assisted by mason raymond and tj brody and I was glad to see Raymond finally slot in the lineup. He was one of the changes there. Uh, Granlin came out so he could slot in, and Potter came out so Watherspoon could slot in. Um, but I was not expecting Bowling to get the first goal, so I was quite pleased with that. Well, actually, based on his reaction, I'm I think he was shocked himself that it went in because like he seemed a little surprised. Yeah, he did. But you need contributions from everybody, and he just happened to be in the right spot, and he picked the right spot to shoot it at. And, you know, I'm glad that he was able to pot one. I think that's only his second goal as a flame. I yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I can go. I'll go check for us while we uh, while we talk about the next goal. But 
Um, the next goal came about three minutes later from the Canucks. It was Sean Mathias uh, scored his first goal of the playoffs to even the game up. And I don't know about you, when the Canucks even things up, I was a little bit worried. I thought that with the Canucks scoring and us going back to uh, tie game, it was going to be a tough uh, hill for the Flames to climb. I thought, oh, the Canucks are coming back now. Well, the thing is that, like, right after Bullock scored, it wasn't like they sucked for a few minutes and then Matthias scored a, a fluky goal. Like, they had several good chances right after the goal, and, like, they kept pushing until they finally found the equalizer. And I was concerned as well, like, oh, you've activated them. And, but then uh, Gaudreau fired that one shot from the goal line on the next shift, and that hit the goal post. Uh, you know, if he was a couple inches further away from the goal line when he shot it, he might have actually scored on it. Uh, yeah. But then, like, Calgary continued to press following that. And uh, Calgary got another goal late in that period. It was uh, TJ Brody's first playoff goal, assisted by Dave Schlemko and Michael Backlund. And, you know, I, while I'm looking at that goal, I want to say that I think Schlemko has, has really upped his game coming into the playoffs. Um, I wasn't sure what to expect of him when we acquired him. But looking at him now, I'm thinking, wow, this is a guy who I think has been one of the most solid blue liners that the Flames have had so far. The thing that surprises me is that he was waived by Arizona, the second worst team in the NHL. He wasn't good enough for them. Was claimed by Dallas, who missed the playoffs, and was waived by them because he wasn't good enough for them, and yet he comes to a playoff team and he looks like a top four defenseman. Yeah, it's, it's kind of weird, isn't it? Yeah, like, uh, you don't understand where the reasoning is on the other teams. Like, I, I know, like, I've looked at uh, fan base reactions with both Arizona and Dallas, and, like, they were both kind of surprised, like, why are you getting rid of him? Like, he didn't do play himself out of a spot. Well, in Dallas, he never really got a shot. True, but at the same time, like, what in the limited appearances, they were pleased with how he played just True. it seems yeah. a, a little bizarre really like normally you don't have quality players getting lost through waivers from bad teams transferring to good teams and them picking it up well and that's why i wasn't sure what to expect of him like i thought okay looking at the teams like you said who've who waived him and the little he's played i thought this is going to be a depth guy down the stretch but he might not do much and so good on him to come in here and show, you know, what he's shown. Because I think he's been a great player, even in the regular season since we acquired him. So, you know, other people's losses are gain. And I really hope this is a guy who's back next year. Yeah, definitely. Like, even if it's just in a 6-7 role, I'd really like to have him back. He's played exceptional, and especially in the playoffs. He's going to be cheap, too, which is nice. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's keep going in this game. Um, after the TJ Brody goal, I don't know about you, but I started to feel some flames energy there. I was happy that we got the goal going into the second period and we we're up. And I really started to feel in that second period, there was no scoring, but that's when it seemed like the flames were run away with the game. Yeah. You, there was only 10 shots in the period, six for Vancouver and four for Calgary, but of the six shots for Vancouver, none of them were particularly dangerous. They were all perimeter shots that uh, any NHL goaltender would stop quite easily. Yeah, and, and you know, credit to the Flames for that because they were able to keep Vancouver out of the shooting lanes for, I'd say, the whole second period. Yeah, and while Calgary didn't really generate too much offense either, they were, I felt, in control of the play more than Vancouver in that period. Yeah, I agree with you. They seemed they came out, you're right, they didn't have as much offense. I think Vancouver was able to shut down our offense for the most part, but Calgary seemed like they were the ones, like you said, they were in control. They were the ones that were really setting the pace in that second period. And I think you could almost start to see Vancouver um, getting upset. You could see their game starting to, I don't want to say fall apart, but I, th I think you could start to see their game 
um, unraveling a bit, they were starting to get frustrated, I think. Yeah, and like especially when uh, they took the two, Calgary took the two penalties at like the five and eight minute marks. Vancouver didn't get anything going on either power play. And I think that's what really started to frustrate them is that they couldn't even generate any zone time, let alone any good offensive chances at Hiller. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, because in the second period, Calgary had a Josh Juris penalty, uh, interference on the goaltender. They had Michael Backlund's boarding penalty, and they had Chris Russell's penalty, and Vancouver wasn't able to score in any of those. No, and even though there was a protracted four-on-four twice because Burroughs and Edler took penalties as well, even during the four-on-four, Vancouver didn't have anything going. Like it, it, it seemed like Calgary was just frustrating them. Yeah, it did. You're right. And I think it was it was enough to knock Vancouver off their game. Well, that's exactly what they needed to do, was contain them and let them try to come at you, but don't give them anything. Yeah, no, for sure. And then in the third, I felt like Calgary really came out and I don't want to say out-muscled Vancouver, but really outplayed Vancouver there. They were playing the better hockey game. They were playing more in Vancouver's end than they were, I think, all game. And they really set the pace there. And it, we got, early in that period, I was happy to see we got Sam Bennett's first, uh, I believe his first goal, no, he sc- did he score in, in the uh, Winnipeg game? No, he got an assist. So right. it was his third point, first goal. First goal is a flame, assisted by Joel Colborn, which was pretty awesome to see. Uh, it sounded like, and you can confirm because you were there, it sounded like the Dome went nuts at that point too. Oh, pretty much. Yeah, it was a madhouse there. Um, it, yeah, the Flames played in the third period much like the Canucks did in game one in the first five minutes where they just threw everything at the opposition. And while Vancouver didn't find a goal, Calgary did. And that just gave them that extra bit of insurance so they could control the pace for the remainder of the game. Yeah, and that's pretty much what happened. As soon as Monaghan got his first playoff goal um, from Goudreau and Russell, the Flames had sealed the deal right there. And I was surprised that Hansen was able to get a goal later on, but you know it was pretty meaningless either way. Yeah, and that was a bit of a misplay by Hiller. He was too far over in his net. Uh, not a big deal. You know, that that's Hiller's big weakness, is if that guy gets out of his net, we have issues. Not a big deal. Didn't cost anything. And then at the end of that game, we saw Vancouver do exactly what Harley got slapped on the wrist for. They put out their bruisers, and they went to town trying to take out the Flames. Yeah, they sent Yannick Weber in to hit Hiller, and kind of stunned and temporarily hurt Hiller. I don't know whether Hiller will see any repercussions from that in game four or you know if it was just a temporary issue i'm not sure because he was down for about five minutes yeah and and i was worried about that because i saw him go down and i thought oh man you know i don't want to lose hiller at this point i don't think we can afford to lose hiller but the weird thing is that Harley gets fined for doing that but then uh willie desjardins does the same thing the next game and there's no repercussion no, and then after the 4-2 goal, uh, Alex Burrows hit Johnny Gaudreau from behind into the boards. Not really a dangerous play because it, it wasn't a very hard hit. But then Burrows went and attacked uh, Chris Russell, getting the instigator for the fight. And... Uh, like, in Game 2, uh, Derek England didn't really do anything to deserve the instigating penalty, but Burroughs did. And yeah, he did. that's why I don't understand why the NHL rescinded his instigating penalty and suspension. Well, and, and again, it's about precedent. Like, to me, if you're setting the precedent with the coaches, you've got to then find, um, you, you've got to find Desjardins as well. And, yeah, you're right, Burroughs definitely deserved the instigator, so I don't know why he's not getting it. Yeah, and then later on, Alex Edler, or no, not Edler, um, Kevin Bieksa, he mugged 
uh, Michael Furland throwing three or four punches before Furland even knew what was going on. Yeah, and, like, I saw I don't that understand too. how that wasn't an instigator and a game misconduct. Well, that's it. Like punching a guy in the anywhere in the body is should be an automatic misconduct. I mean, if nothing else, you know, he should have got a penalty, and it seemed like nothing happened there at all. No, and like if you're gonna call penalties, call them fairly for both sides. And like I don't care if like the say like the Flames get those penalties in game two, that's fine. You're gonna call it that way. Be consistent. That's At least all, then that's we know what we can and can't get away with. Yeah, because then okay, if you're gonna do this, then this is what the result is. But. It, there was no consistency from the refing in game two to the refing in game three. Yeah, and, and it's really weird because, yeah, it changed each game and it makes it so the players have no idea what they can get away with. It's like whatever they decide that they want to they wanna call that game, they're going to call or whatever they said they want to find. So I, I'm i totally confused by what's going on with the refing right now. Well, like if you look at... Uh, Dan Hamuse, he uh, elbowed Sam Bennett. And that, you can't get away with hitting players in the head. And, like, that was only a two-minute minor, which I thought that was a little bit. Yeah, I thought he was going to get a major for that. Yeah, because you just don't go and elbow somebody in the face. Like, that should have at least been reviewed by the NHL. I don't think it. With the playoffs, I don't think that was worthy of a suspension, but at least a review, but the NHL didn't even review that. But, yeah, no, I, I think it's setting a bad precedent now going into game four that I, I'm worried that, I mean, we've seen, you know, this game start to get violent near the end. I'm worried that in game four somebody's going to get hurt. Yeah, exactly. And, like, say, like, the Flames are leading in game four at the end like what is burrows just gonna go and deck somebody or bxa or whatever or vice versa if the canucks are winning like uh you know you you don't want to see somebody getting carried off on a stretcher because there was no control by the referees yeah no it, it worries me because i think we're lucky that nobody's got hurt so far um, you know, especially with what's going on, I was expecting someone was going to be injured by this point. And yeah, I agree with you. You don't want to say, well, this is okay to do. And, you know, we saw the intensity, I think, of the fights go up from game three to game two. So think of what we might see in game four. Like, it's going to get nasty here if the refs don't start making up their mind and enforcing something. Yeah, and... That that's the nature of uh, play is that you push the boundaries, and okay, well the plays that happened in game three, those are apparently okay. So if I do a little bit more, is that going to be a problem? Yeah, well that's exactly what the refs are saying: is what happened is okay, and that's not okay because like it, you look at. Uh, Subban slash on Mark Stone breaking his wrist. Well, he didn't even get a suspension for that. How is that? You know, like you're just allowing players to take liberties with the opposition with no repercussions, which is so dangerous. Yeah, because one stupid incident can be, <laughs> you know, a very very bad thing and. And this time of year, teams are really trying to protect their players. It's just not a bright idea for the NHL itself. And like, if I was the in charge of player safety, I'd be <laughs> flipping out. Not just in the Flames series, but in a lot of the series. Yeah, I agree. If I was working at the NHLPA, I'd probably be on the phone with the league on what the hell's going on here. You're going to hurt somebody. Yeah. Like, somebody's going to be going off on a stretcher, and who knows? Like, it could be a very, very serious incident, not just a serious one. Yeah, and, and I worry that it's going to get outside of just the tough guys. Like you were saying, you know, we saw them go after, uh, we, we saw the elbow to the head at the end from someone who wasn't looking for the fight. And I worry that it could be one of the Flames or even one of the Canucks top, you know, scorers who gets taken out because someone's trying to prove a point. 
Yeah, well, it's not even in just our series either. Like, we have saw Mark Stone get hurt. Who's to say a guy like uh, Gustav Nyquist or Zetterberg or whatever gets exactly. hurt because, oh, well, the refs are allowing what's going on in Calgary to go on, so I can do that. Yeah, no, you're exactly it's right. It's just yeah. not safe, and you don't want to see players getting hurt because of stupidity. I'm hoping that the refs, now that we're in the second week of the playoffs, have had some sort of all-hands meeting, and whoever's in charge of refing today, I don't even know who it is anymore, has said, guys, we got to cut this out. Yeah, and I, I would hope that there are memos being sent to each team with spelling out the exact guidelines of okay this happened we're not comfortable with this yeah we're sorry this didn't get called from now on it will yeah and it i don't know i just hope that nobody gets hurt because of this me too well let's uh let's talk about something a little bit more upbeat then uh the flames saw cory potter sit out in game three and tyler watherspoon slotted in He's only played one game so far this year with the Flames in the regular season, which was the Winnipeg game at the very end. And as you know, they've called him up a lot and never played him. And in game three, he had seven shifts, and he played a total of five minutes and nine seconds. Uh, you were there. What did you think of what we saw from Watherspoon? I was a little concerned with his foot speed. I uh, He... Played reasonably well defensively. Uh, there was one uh, play, if I recall, where he had the puck in front of the Flames net and was a little too patient with it. Um, other than that, he was just okay. I I don't... I probably would go back to Potter in Game 4. It, I just think that uh, his lack of foot speed is what's the problem. Well, and, and it's interesting as I look at this... Um... Watherspoon played seven shifts, four of them in the first period, or yeah, four of them in the first period, and three of them in the second period, and he didn't play at all in the third period. So to me, that shows that Hartley's probably not happy with what he'd seen there. No, and it, it wasn't the best performance by him. Like, he wasn't, he didn't screw up at any point where it was observable that, you know, like he gave the puck away like the uh, Canucks defenseman to Jones. It, there was nothing like that. But it you just don't want him to be in a situation where a mistake like that can happen. And Yeah, I, and, and that's the thing. is I When I was looking at him from what I saw on TV, which is obviously limited, he looked like a guy who, were lucky, wasn't a liability. I know that sounds kind of bad, but it looked like he was not comfortable and he may have ended up as a liability. Yeah, and that's not to say that Waterspoon's a failed prospect and will never play for the Flames or anything like that. It's just that it, these games are all do or die and can change off one shift, one mistake. So you don't want to have players out there that you know are prone to making that one mistake, and it. It's not that he's a bad player. It's just he's not equipped for this series. Well, and he doesn't have a lot of NHL experience, and he hasn't played with the team this year, so he's probably not as confident of what to do. So, you know, I'm surprised. I don't know if Potter's hurt, but I'm surprised if he wasn't that they would have sat Potter and put Watherspoon in. Yeah, and we'll see exactly what happens for Game 4, but I would be somewhat surprised if Watherspoon draws back in. And that's a testament to the improved play of David Schlemko as he basically ate all the minutes of Watherspoons and cycled through the other defenders. Yeah. Well, if we look at... So I'm just comparing time on ice stats here in Game 3 for Watherspoon and Game 2 for Potter. Uh, so Watherspoon had seven shifts. He played three and a half minutes in the first period and a minute and a half in the second period. Um, his average shift length was 44 seconds. If we look at Potter in game two, he played nine shifts spanning over three periods, which is about what I expect for a guy in the last pairing. Uh, he played a minute and a half in the first period, 44 seconds in the second period, and three minutes and 11 seconds in the third period. He played about, he only played uh, about 30 seconds more than Wotherspoon did, but he, he 
I was noticing Potter doing the right things in game two. And the few times I noticed Watherspoon in game three, I was nervous. Potter played a little bit more like once the game was out of reach just to give the other guys a rest. But I don't know. I'm just not really too comfortable with either guy. I was wishing that the Flames would have some more depth on defense, especially in a situation like this. But there's not much you can do when you have two of your normal top six guys out. Yeah, and seeing what we've seen from Watherspoon now in that game, it worries me a bit too because he was supposed to be the top defensive prospect. And now I'm kind of worried because if he's not maybe ready to step in like you know some of the forwards have been, who have we got? Oh, no, like on the farm, the only guy that uh, is relatively close is uh, Morrison, Kenny Morrison, who they just signed. But he's not even eligible to play this year. So, and I mean, you know, you know, I've been a big Patrick Seeloff fan for a while, but Seeloff isn't ready. Um, you know, he's taken a step back since all of his injuries. Um, there's really, there's really nobody left that you can really look at and say, you know, this guy might be able to step in. Like, I think we've got a huge hole now if Watherspoon isn't where we think he is um, to, you know, shore up the blue line depth. Yeah, like the only other guy that might get slotted in at any point is Brett Kulak, and, you know, that would only be in a situation where a couple guys go down with injury and you're kind of screwed. The Flames have an exceptionally deep group of young forwards, and like if the Flames lost three or four guys to injury, we'd have quality players being able to replace them. Well, that's one of the keys that I think the Flames have to victory in the playoffs, but we better not get a blue line injury. Yeah, and that's the problem, that we don't have anybody. Like, even if you were to snag somebody from the junior ranks, the only guys that we have are Waugh and uh, Kanzig, and neither one of those guys I would put in either. Not a lot of options there. No, which is a bit, little bit worrying. Well, Matt, anything else about Game 3 you want to talk about? Uh, fans, top-notch performance. Awesome job. Keep it up. Um, so let's talk about that then. Looking ahead, we need uh, part two of the Sea of Red to flow into the dome and give the Flames the extra power they need. And tomorrow night, the Flames are up 2-1, to one, and they're back here at home, sleeping in their own beds, taking on the Canucks again. And what are you expecting from that game? I'm expecting the Canucks to come out like they did in game two and try to throw everything at the Flames to try and quiet the Sea of Red. I'm hoping that the Flames have a better response to the early onslaught that I'm anticipating because I don't expect Vancouver just to roll over and die. Uh, they're going to be wanting to find the equalizer in the series, and I just hope that the Flames can weather the storm for the first 5-10 minutes and then push back themselves. Yeah, I think you're right. That's going to be the keys. If the Flames can hold their ground for the first 10 minutes, and as we know, the Flames don't tend to do well in period one, but I think coming out early is going to be the key to winning game four. I think whichever team can take advantage and really you know, make uh, the game theirs in the first period is probably going to be the team that's going to win. I can agree with that. It'll be interesting to see if... Uh... Ryan Miller starts game four. I don't know if he's even 100% yet. Yeah, I, I'm not sure where he's at. Um, and speaking of goalies, in game two, we actually saw uh, Kari Ramo put in for the last five minutes of that game. So I don't know if Ramo's ready or if they were if he's you know ready enough just to play five minutes. I'm not sure what his status is, but I'm hoping that he's back and ready to go. Yeah, and we'll see. Like It, it just gives the Flames more options and, like, uh, with Calgary recalling Yanni Ortio, it, if uh, Hiller has a bad game, at least you have options going into game five. Yeah, uh, Ramo is still listed on the Flames side as a day-to-day -day injury, so I'm not sure what's going on there. But I'm sure we will find out. Um, but, you know, I think if I was Vancouver, I would, if if Miller is ready, I think I'd probably change goalies at this point just to throw Calgary off. You know, I think it's it's a goalie they, they aren't expecting to see, and it could make it harder for Calgary, so I think I would probably do that if I was Willie Desjardins and he was ready to go. Yeah, 
one of the things that the Flames seem to have found is that uh, point shots are a weakness for Lack. And, like, if you look at Russell, he scored. Brody, he scored one. I think Russell scored a second one in game two. Well, let, let's give credit to Lack, though. It's not just the point shots. It's that we've had good screens on those as well. Oh, yeah. It, but anytime you can find a weakness in a goaltender like that, uh, it might be a good idea to swap the goalies so as to throw off the other team so that way they don't target that weakness specifically. So I, I'm I'm thinking similar to you. I think the first period is going to be important, and I think uh, Vancouver is going to come out like they did in game two, but I'm expecting a lot more of a chippy game. I think especially from Vancouver, seeing what everyone's got away with, I'm expecting a much more, I don't want to say violent game, but I'm expecting much more of a, uh, a game with more cheap shots, more guys trying to take liberties on each other, and a game that's really going to need the officials to to come out early and put their foot down and say, you know, this is the way that we're going to let this game be played. And I think that's going to dictate a lot of who wins that game as well. Yeah, I agree. And the Flames need to be prepared uh, and cognizant of who's on the ice at all times. So that way, it, like if uh, the goon squad goes out against the Monaghan line to make sure that that's not a matchup so that way they don't like attempt to injure anybody there and and you know the flames having uh the last change is going to help with that but you're right i think that they need to communicate with the bench at the same time and know when it's time to get off the ice and it might be shorter shifts than the guys want we might have to give up some potential offensive uh scenarios because of it but we got to keep those guys safe yep that way they don't get injured so that way they can try and win the series i also think that in order to win this series and especially next game we need to see better performance from our first line our uh, monahan goudreau and hoodler line yeah it, it's one of those things that if these games were in the regular season i think both uh hoodler and monahan would not be playing they just don't seem themselves. Monahan's not as bad as Hoodler, um, and like you saw that with Monahan scoring, it's just they don't seem right. And uh, you know, it's the playoffs, so everybody goes if they can skate. It's just not much you can do. Yeah, and it's you know if that line isn't working, I think that we need to make some change somewhere. Um, you know, maybe we have to switch some guys in or out. Maybe we got to try Bennett there. But to me, that line has the potential to be scoring. And if they're not, I don't know that we can rely on the other three lines to carry the weight the whole time. Yeah. Well, it's almost getting to the point, like, if Monaghan and Hoodler are going to struggle as much as they are, that perhaps you slide Bolig up and put Gaudreau with Juris and Stajan or something on the fourth line and have those guys try to score as well. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Hartley's trying to stay with what's familiar and what everybody knows, but I don't I don't think it's going to work out the way he wants it to in the end. And I, I think it's time to make a change uh, while you're at home before they go back on the road. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if we see some lineup changes um, going into game four, some significant lineup changes. Yeah. And, like, if you had uh, Gaudreau on a line with Juris and, say, Mason Raymond or whatever, like, that's still not a bad line. I wouldn't I wouldn't want to see them break up the BBC line or uh, Furland with Jones and Stajan because they are clicking. But, you know, we'll see. Yeah, I just don't know if you don't break up the BBC line who you put on the first line that's going to keep the offensive... Uh firepower up i don't know that mason raymond's the right guy yeah i don't know bowling's the right guy i think if i was uh hartley i might try moving um bennett up well the thing is that bennett and colborne seem to have a good and backland seem to have a good thing going so like if it ain't broke i wouldn't try to change that yeah, I see where you're coming from, but at the same time, if, we, if we're if we going to make a change, we're going to have to break something up. 
right? So I guess, you know, it depends. And, and you know, the other thing you could do is you could move the BBC line to the first line and give them first line minutes. Um, demote, um, you know, Monaghan's line, whatever form that's going to be, so they have less minutes and then they can try some new out there. But, you know, it, it's one of those things, though, that, like, while the Monaghan line hasn't been particularly effective, neither have the Sedins. And the Flames have really keyed in on them and prevented them from doing much of anything as well. So it might just be that uh, the Monaghan line is facing the Canucks' best defensemen and they're keying in on exactly what they're doing. Yeah, you could be right there. I didn't really think about that, but yeah, you're totally right. Um, the yeah, the Canucks really their first line's not that effective either. No, because I think the Canucks only have like two or three points from the Sedins thus far, which is somewhat shocking after the good season they've had. So we'll see. Game four prediction, Matt. What's going to happen? I'll go with the four three Calgary win in overtime. You know, I was thinking before you said that, I thought it was going to be an overtime win. I just have this nagging feeling in the back of my mind. These teams seem so evenly matched that, yeah, I think it's going to take an overtime. I don't know if I'm going to go 4-3. I'm going to say Calgary wins 3-2 in overtime. And one uh, thing that I do have to mention as a positive for Vancouver, Bo Horvat is a really damn good player. He is, and it's it's almost conflicting because I want to watch him play and I want to like him, but it's like he's against us. Yeah, it, it, he's a really dynamite player, and it's been a treat to watch him, even though it's against the Flames. It, you know, you always like to see talented hockey players, and Horvat has really upped his game in the playoffs, and he'll be a real pain in the side of Flames fans for years. He will, for sure. There's there's no question in my mind that Bo Horvat is going to stick around in the NHL for a long time. And I think, um, you know, he's probably going to be a Canuck for a while because I can't see them wanting to get rid of him. So we're going to have to get used to him now because I think he'll be here for a while. Yeah. At the time, I thought it was a bit of a questionable pick at number nine when the Flames traded Corey Schneider to the Devils. But he's been full marks. Uh, Matt, last week you and I made predictions as to who we thought were going to be the players to watch this round. Uh, I thought it was going to be the dark horse, Michael Furland, and you picked more, perhaps a safer choice in Sam Bennett. I would say right now those are the two best guys in the ice with a C on their chest. What do you think? Yeah, uh, full marks to the pair of us for our excellent selections. I, I like the Furland pick as well. So, yeah, no, they've been awesome for the Flames. By far the Flames' best and most consistent players through the first three games. So there's a question that's been on my mind all day. Maybe you can weigh in. Who do you think is going to have more big hits in their career? George Canyon or Michael Furland? Furland, without a doubt. George Canyon's had some hits. I looked, he hasn't made it to number 10, but he's had some hits in the charts. So, yeah, I think I think Furland is progressing nicely. I think Boma being out has actually been an advantage for Furland because he's really got to show what he's got. And I wouldn't be surprised if maybe Bowling's out of a job here next year because of it. Well, I wouldn't go that far quite yet. It, it, Furland only has 26 games, and Bowling has won the Stanley Cup. So I wouldn't go that far, but they'll definitely be competing for the same jobs next year. And if you look... Hunter Smith and Austin Carroll, who are very much the same types of players as Furland and Boma, are on their way up their ranks. So we might be seeing a whole bunch of Furland-esque players in the future. And seeing how Boma is becoming more of an offensive threat, it might be that you know Boma is transitioning out of that enforcer role, which allows Furland to transfer into it. And that would be perfectly fine. And you know you don't want to see Boma continuing to block shots and all that every game all year because that's going to limit his the length and duration of his career. So, like, you saw him breaking his wrist against the Coyotes. So, uh, I, I don't particularly want him to play like that if it's going to limit him as a player. 
Well, it, unless there's anything else about Game 4, why don't we run down a couple things about uh, some Flames signings this week. Anything you want to talk about in Game 4? I just hope the Flames can find a way to win. That's all. They have to. It would be amazing to go back to Vancouver up 3-1. to one. Yeah, it would take a little bit of edge off in case Game 5 goes sideways. Yeah, it gives you that cushion that you want. Well, in other Flames news then, away from the actual uh, Flames ice that we've been watching, uh, the Flames signed college standout goaltender John Gillies this week. His team, I believe, won the Frozen Four tournament, so congratulations to them. And he's now been signed to a three-year deal, which starts this year. And Gillies has joined the team and has been practicing with them in both Vancouver and Calgary. Matt, you're a, a Gillies fan. What should fans know about John Gillies? He is a huge goaltender. Uh, he's six foot six and he's quick. Uh, he stylistically, the goaltender that he reminds me the most of is Roberto Luongo, but he has three inches on the Luongo. So yeah, he's definitely going to be a player for the flames in the future. Whether he reaches his potential or not is yet to be determined, but he could very well be one of the top goaltenders in the NHL. Do you think that Gillies will um, jump over Yoni Ordeo next year and potentially compete for a spot at the NHL? It is possible. It depends on how well he plays in Stockton. I'm expecting Gillies to start in the AHL. But if Gillies blows everybody away in the AHL, uh, you can only contain a player for so long. And like we saw guy like Emil Pori get recalled and if uh, Gillies is blowing everybody away in the AHL then you have to make room and if that means Ordeo becomes the third wheel or the Flames have to trade off a goalie that so be it yeah I, I think that Ordeo's spot as number two or three depending on how things shake down this year is probably secured but yeah I can see Gillies getting the lead job in Stockton and staying there for most of the year. I'm I'm happy with the signing. It's a, it's a good signing, and I'll be curious to see what he brings to training camp now that he's signed. The other move the Flames made uh, this week, uh, now that the Adirondack Flames season is finished, unfortunately, um, Yoni Ordeo was recalled to the Flames. So they've got four goaltenders up here now, and I'm not expecting Ordeo nor Gillies to see any playoff time. Are you? The only way that would happen is if uh, there was an injury to one of the starting goaltenders and the Flames decided that, uh, like, say the other guy struggled, like, say Hiller can't go for game four and Ramo plays poorly, then they might throw one of the other guys in. So if you're goalie coach Jordan Siglett or Bob Hartley or whoever makes that choice and you had to be in that position, who would you dress at that point, would you go Gillies or Ordeo? I would go Gillies just because Ordeo's coming off an injury, and he might not be sharp. Good point. I was going to say Ordeo because we've seen great work from him at the NHL level, and I guess to me that would depend, too, if he looks 100% in practice or not. But to me, Ordeo would be my first guy that I'd bring in. Yeah, if Ordeo was healthy 100%, I would take him just because he has more experience, but it, because he's also coming off an injury, I don't I haven't watched him in practice or anything, so I wouldn't know. I agree. Well, let's transition from the Flames for just a second. Uh let's move up the road to our friends in Edmonton. And as we know, the NHL uh, draft lottery took place on Saturday, and no surprise, the Oilers got the first overall pick and will probably be picking Connor McDavid. Do you think there's any doubt there, Matt? No. I would be shocked if they went with Jack Eichel. Not to say that Eichel's a bad player, but yeah, anytime you're dealing with the likely the second best player since Sidney Crosby, yeah, I, you only have one choice there. Do you think the Oilers would trade the pick? They would honestly it would make more sense for them to trade off all of the other players that are on their roster and keep McDavid and start over. I agree with that. Do you think there's any way that McDavid 
gets signed. He he didn't look too happy talking about Edmonton that day. He he's given Edmonton fans credit, but he didn't look too happy talking about Edmonton. Do you think there's any way he pulls a Lindros and doesn't sign? Honestly, I wouldn't be shocked. Uh, he looked somewhat like uh, the same look that uh, Dexter Morgan from the TV show had before he goes and kills somebody. <laughs> so you know that kind of this level of disgust on his face. So I I could definitely see McDavid pulling a Lindros, and if the Oilers don't make changes to their off ice personnel, it might actually be the best decision that he could make. I can't see him wanting to, you know, even even if you're not happy, you put on a happy face, at, you know, for something like that, because this is the team that's going to draft you. So I I I have a feeling this may not be as cut and dry as we think. I might I think there might be some backroom politics there. And I honestly wouldn't be surprised if Edmonton goes up and drafts Eichel because they've had some conversations with McDavid. Yeah, well, like if I was uh, McDavid, I would be instructing my agent to basically threaten the Oilers to like fire the management structure there. Otherwise, I'm going to pull Lindros <laughs> because of the fact that you look at how they've ruined Nail Yakupov None of Hall, Eberly, or Nugent Hopkins have played as well as they should have. Uh, you know, if uh, I'm McDavid, I don't want to go in a situation where I'm not being utilized properly. Because at the end of the day, like it, it could be the difference between not receiving $30 million plus dollars or more at the end of the career. And... You know, you want to go in a situation where you can reach your potential. And in Edmonton, that's not the case. I don't know if he will threaten them, but I could see him saying if it's going to be the same management structure walking up on the stage, call Jack's name. Put it this way, I would not have the same stigma towards McDavid if he decided to pull Lindros. Like, I didn't wasn't a fan when Lindros uh, did that to Quebec, but Quebec didn't have the legacy of being completely inept that Edmonton does. Exactly. I think, if anything, if McDavid does it, it might be a kick in the pants for the Oilers organization. I think he could actually help them in a way by doing it. It wasn't too long ago that the Flames had some similar, um, not to the same level, but the Flames' for first round pick, number 23rd overall in the 2009 entry draft, Tim Erickson, refused to sign here during the Jay Feaster era. And it actually turned out, I think, to be a blessing in disguise. I think it's been one of the best trades the Flames have made in the last five years. And we managed to ship Erickson out to the Rangers for Roman Horak. And two players that we've seen play with the Flames this year centerman Marcus Granlin and defenseman Tyler Watherspoon. Yeah, well, like, if you look at the Lindros trade, um, the Nordiques received Peter Forsberg and, like, a whole whack of other assets that they ended up using to parlay that team into a Stanley Cup champion a few years later. So if McDavid does say, I'm not playing for Edmonton and demands a trade, it's not going to be a bad thing for the Oilers because you'll look, you'll have 29 teams foaming at the mouth trying to get them. Even if they don't, even if they don't draft him, I think you could trade that pick before you even make the draft for a king's ransom. You get whatever you want. Yeah, like you could just go to any team, like you, you say Toronto, and say, "Give me Kessel, give me Morgan Riley, give me your first round pick, and Dion Phaneuf." And the Leafs would probably say, "Yeah, sure, okay." Well, and and I think you would have twenty nine teams who'd want to talk to you if you say this pick is available. 29 teams are going to want to chat. Yeah, well, like, even the Flames made an offer for Lindros. I think the Flames offered Vernon Neuendijk and a couple other things at the time. So let's look at let's look at the actual Lindros trade. Uh, Philadelphia acquired Eric Lindros, and the Quebec Nordiques acquired Steve Deshane, Peter Forsberg, Ron Hextall, Kerry Huffman, Mike Ricci, $15 million cash, the 1993 first-round pick, which turned out to be Jocelyn Tebow, and future considerations, which turned out to be Chris Simon, um, and 1994 first-round pick Nolan Baumgartner. So quite a king's ransom there. Yeah, and considering McDavid is of that same ilk of prospect, uh, if the Oilers did have to trade him like the Nordiques with Lindros, 
you know, you're going to get a lot of talent heading to Edmonton. And it might actually end up making more sense to either trade him or blow off guys like Hall and Eberle and sort of like start over. Yeah, they have big decisions to make this summer as to what they want to do. But either way, they could, I think, more chance now than ever to change their franchise. There's going to be big changes. I think there has to be, but I've said this for a while. There has to be big changes to the coaching and to the front office. But I agree with you. I think no matter who it is, um, we need to see big changes in Edmonton. And this is the best time now than ever before to do it. Whatever chance decision you decide to make, whether it's to get rid of McDavid or to get rid of all your key players. I mean, you'll get a King's ransom for Hall. You'll get, you know, a good return for Eberly. Like the Oilers have the pieces they need to turn this team around. Well, Matt, before we go tonight, um, I want to remind all our fans that we're doing our first ever uh, listener survey. We're doing an audience survey to figure out what our fans want, what they like, what perhaps changes they'd like to see us make. Uh, the feedback that fans give us is going to go right into next season as we're starting to make some big changes here. We want to know, what do you want to see on the show different? What do you like that we do so we make sure we keep it in? Um, all that sort of thing. And we've got the link to take the survey at our website right near the top. It's uh, firesidechat.ca, and you'll see the link there. Or go to firesidechat.ca slash survey. In June, just for the entry draft, we're going to draft. We're gonna draw one person's name at random who's taking the survey and giving us their info. And we've got a cool little prize pack that we've put together. Uh, we've got a Fireside Chat t-shirt, a Calgary Flames baseball cap, a Fireside Chat can cooler, uh, some Flames temporary tattoos, some Flames logo stickers, and a Calgary Flames bag for them. So a little prize pack for one random fan. So if you haven't yet, go take our survey. We want to know what you want. This show's for you guys. So tell us what you want to hear next year, and uh, that would really help us out. Anything else you want to chat about, Matt? Not at all. Well, go Flames, go. And Matt, I will talk to you soon, my friend. Yep. Nice talking to you again. And it'll be a fun series, that's for sure. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.